welcome to the live feed recording of Teach Me Five Squared, which happened on the 20th of June 2014. We've basically taken the live feed recording, we've taken out all the, um, the boring bits, and I hope you enjoy it. You're about to step into a much larger world. It's just amazing, you're gonna get hooked on it. I had my first teach meet about two, two and a half years ago and I'm an absolute addict. I just love them, they're an awesome way of networking, but I'm gonna talk about why they're so awesome. So, um, first of all, um, they're great because it's about ideas and inspiration and, and it's breaking down those classroom walls at a global level where we actually start to get all of these ideas. And I, I talk globally because, hi everybody, we've got the live stream happening which is going all over the world at the moment um, and hopefully you can hear me clearly. Yeah. Um, so ideas and inspiration to actually move your teaching practice and do something different. And if you can pick up two ideas then you're doing really well at a teach meet and everyone is very uniquely different. Um, second one is networking. This is the thing I love about it and a lot of people here I already know through Twitter and a few other things it's a great time to actually sit down with people in the break in the intermission and actually network with them because that's a really big powerful thing about teach me and if you're into Twitter that opens your network like you wouldn't believe. And I love to learn. You obviously love to learn too because you're here on a Friday. Um, and everyone on the live stream, you're on the live stream. Um, it's about learning and as teachers I, I believe we have to be lifelong learners. We have to enjoy what we're doing so that we can then feed that into our students and help them become lifelong learners. And I think it's about really leading the way for our students. Um, the networking now, there's so many different ways you can network. Um, social media, Facebook, Twitter, um, and Teach Me to very big into Twitter. And so you'll see actually, this is a hashtag for the event, and I already see a lot of people tweeting out. So we're actually sharing to a much larger audience what's happening here. And also for the live feed, we're trying something a little bit different where people from outside can actually interact with the presenters. I'm going to talk about that very soon. So our theme tonight. Um, we teach in exciting times, really. Um, innovation is one of those things that when you look at the world, it is changing so fast. And as educators, we need to change also. And this is a great way of actually doing it. So do you have a teaching method, tool or idea which has transformed your teaching practice and improved student lives forever? So we're really sharing what we do in the classroom to you guys and to the live stream. I want to tell you a story, mm -hmm. okay? We had our, our teach meet, we had 70, it was awesome. Was anyone at our last teach meet? Yeah, and it was such a fun night. We had to teach eat afterwards and it was great. We got a lot of feedback from uh, our college structure and people from outside. And I went away for a couple of weeks. And you know what, some of that feedback was we didn't get a chance to actually talk to the presenters. And traditionally at TeachMeet, there are, um, in the intermission you get to talk, but a lot of the presenters went. Some people didn't go to the teach eat, so they didn't get to really um, talk about what these presenters had done. Now, three weeks later, you're wondering why I've got a um, dog sleeping. I woke up in the middle of the night, two o'clock in the morning, and I scrawled the Teach Me Five Squared concept onto a bit of paper, and I thought, how cool would that be? You know, that we change it a little bit. And it, when I pushed it out to Twitter, a lot of people were really happy about it. A couple of people not so happy, because it does move slightly away from the original idea of Teach Me. So, the concept. We have five by five minute presentations, so, um, what we did find with the two minute um, presentations, a lot of people were banging out so many ideas and we're oh, no, so fast and in the end your head's spinning and you go, oh that's the end of it. So five minute, so five by five minute presentations followed by a 10 minute Q&A session. Now this is where the live stream and those people from outside can actually interact. So each presenter will come up, they will present, come and sit down here and this is the um, five squared area. 
right, at the end of our first um, five by five, you guys get 10 minutes to ask questions, two minutes max. And this is where the Padlet boards come in. And we'll be tweeting, I've tweeted out the three Padlet boards in that people who are outside can actually start popping their, their questions up. So you'll see that we've got the um, presenter and their presentation. So there's session one, session two, and session three boards. So you'll find on your um, program QR codes. Now, a lot of you have your mobile devices. Just scan there for session one, scan there for session two, and session three. So that you, if we run out of time, you can put your questions up and then presenters can actually talk to you in the intermission or answer a few questions. Um, now, how the program works, I'm just gonna click this. Hopefully that comes up quickly. So basically what we have is we have session one and then the five squared session, 10 minutes Q and A. Then we roll directly into the session two five by five, and then the um, 10 minute Q&A. Then we've got about 20, 25 minutes where upstairs we have soup, we have some beautiful fruit platters, coffee, tea, and feel free at any time to just wander up. Um, we're gonna do a bit of speed dating. No, I don't wanna do speed dating. <laughs> yeah, yeah, all right. It's very important to, right. to network, is to get to know other people. <laughs> um, so we have talked about the Padlets and just a bit of housekeeping. Now this is where I feel like a bit of a hostie where I'm going, the, um, the toilets are up there, exit is out there. Um, Wi-Fi. Now if you are within the Department of Education, just log in with your normal DC password and uh, username. If you are not, over here you'll notice there's a Chroma Wi-Fi. And that is the um, password there, so you can access some uh, Wi-Fi. Uh, food, I've talked about, soup upstairs, coffee, tea, whenever you feel like it. And enjoy the show. All right, well, we're gonna, we're gonna sit over here. I've never done this in Teach Me History. I want to present uh, Michelle Jensen. <laughs> and sorry, Michelle, I don't look like it. I'm Michelle Jensen. Michelle couldn't make it today. Oh. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Speed dating. Yeah, speed dating. <laughs> so, and I'm sure Michelle's having a bit of a laugh right now. She said, oh, are you sure you want to do this? And I, yeah, why not? Let's do it. Um, so I'm basically going to give her presentation and I have this here, so are you stuck? Basically, ready? one thing I didn't talk about was timing. Benny over here um, from the college, he's a bit of a Nazi when it comes to um, those five minutes. When the five minutes is up to keep the integrity of the overall program. So at four minutes, he's going to lift the one minute and show the presenter so that they know they've got one minute. All right, Benny, I'm gonna race you. you ready? Okay. <laughs> Go. All right, so Michelle's um, presenting the maker space in the library. Now, she's an amazing um, teacher librarian, very unlike anyone I've ever seen. Um, she's into virtual worlds, uh, maker spaces, and she's taken technology and blended it with teaching and learning in a way I've never seen. She's right into gamification also. So this is um, about her maker space in the library. So. I've known her for a couple of years, and one of the things was she got into Raspberry Pi. Has anyone heard of Raspberry mm -hmm. Pi before? Yes. Yeah, because some people go, why would you put raspberries in a pie? <laughs> Don't know. But actually, for those who are not sure, this is a Raspberry <coughs> Pi. And the great thing about this, this is about coding. Very, very simple, and I uh, should probably, at slide two, um, I use Raspberry Pis as they don't blow up as easily as uh, an Android, I think. Okay. Uh, this is the maker space at the back of the library. 
and I'm reading from here. I started um, the push for a makerspace at my new school in Term 1. Great thing about makerspace is a whole range of different things that you can bring up and getting that creativity happening with um, computer coding and Raspberry Pi. I waited for the students to ask me what it was about. Soon I had a list of students that wanted to join a club. By week seven, I had a roster of club days. So that's how fast there was the uptake and the engagement for the students. Um, so she taught the students in groups of five. Uh, and that's a picture of them there. Uh, slide six, uh, the draw card for my students is still Minecraft as my Raspberry Pi kits have Minecraft loaded. So how many people play Minecraft? <laughs> now, this is where the gamification, um, how am I going, Benny? This is where the gamification sort of comes in, and I've not, I've played a bit of Minecraft, but actually blending this um, virtual world game into education is a really different way of actually bringing in those um, kids and engaging them. Um, I, I'll just say quickly, Michelle, that basically if you know what Plane is, it was a virtual world. Michelle's actually set up a, um, a library set up within the Plane. So it's across all of the different systems. But you can go in there as an avatar and walk around. It's so cool. It's really, really cool. Um, the push button builds a glass floor in the um, of Minecraft. My students have now changed the floor to every type of brick available in Minecraft. Just form this simple um, excursion. If you attend my conference that uh, Simon is presenting at the Masterclass <laughs> Workshop Days, that, that's a shameless um, uh, plug there, Michelle, I must say. But that's OK. Um, so slide nine. Um, I first started working with Raspberry Pis last year of my last school. I gave my Year 7s a pie in its box and asked them to give it a go. I told them it was cutting edge technology. And when you think, you know, we're teaching kids in year two and three to code uh, as secondary teachers, um, I hope we're, we're up just for, you know, five, six years, it's going to be a different landscape. Um, and let the, pe the kids have fun. That's really, really important. Um, my end of lesson. At 55 minutes, they have made a game in Scratch on Pi. So 55 minutes, that's pretty phenomenal. And I think that's it. Thank you. How did I go, Benny? Four minutes. Four Yay! minutes. Excellent. <laughs> and now I'm going to go and sit on the couch. How was that? Was it good? <laughs>to introduce Ben. Ben's the teaching and learning head teacher of our college structure. All round good guy. Um, he's played around with a whole range of different technologies and he's really a, a very much a quiet achiever in our college. So, are you timing? Yeah, I'm okay, ready. Excellent. As soon as he starts, I'll start. Alright, my main uh, aim today, my main goal is to uh, encourage everyone to teach about the brain. Teach kids about the brain and specifically that it's malleable. Not working. But the uh, studies show that when you teach kids that the brain is malleable, then you uh, you bring hope, right? you increase their motivation, and you uh, you build resilience. A lot of kids are, uh, have been raised thinking that you're either born smart, dumb, or or yeah. average, okay? and that's and that's not the case. And I guess in a way we're all brain mechanics, right? At, at school, we work with students' brains every day. And so I guess we should know something about the brain ourselves. Now there's this ongoing discussion or debate, you know, what's more important in uh, building your abilities? Is it nature? Is it nurture? I guess it's your genes, is it your teachers, parents, right? And that's, they're all good discussions, but I think it overlooks a very important part. And that's what each of you or each of us contribute, right, to, uh, to become the person that we are. We're not just passive agents in, uh, between nature and, and nurture, right? <coughs> if we don't put effort into uh, things that we want to become good at, then uh, I don't think we're going to reach our potential. 
right? So the main message really is that the brain is like a muscle. Might use it or lose it. Uh, and teaching kids about synapses and neurons, I think that's, that's, that's really good. Okay, that's not where I'm going to focus today. Right? But still, I think it's, it's important to know right, that any, any movement or any uh, thought process starts off as an electrical impulse that travels through neurons, okay, a circuit of neurons. But that's uh, important to consider to begin with. These machines have sort of advanced the, uh, our understanding of the brain, because before we used to have to really work on uh, cruel experiments on monkeys and rats to, have, to be able to study the, uh, the brain. But at the moment, right, we can actually, in real time, map and measure what's going on in somebody's brain as they're working on something. Right? So these have caused a real quick advancement. Right, that sort of cut off the rest of my word over there. Myelination. Right? So this is what I want you to talk to you guys about. Right, so myelin right, is insulation that wraps around this nerve, uh, these neurons, right? and it increases the, uh, the speed and the strength of the neuron. The more myelin, the faster, the more speed, the more accurate the, uh, the impulse of the signal is. Now, uh, these are oligodendrocytes. Now, there are 100 billion neurons in your brain, okay? But that's really only 10% of the of the, uh, the cells that are in your brain. The rest of them, 90% of it's made of uh, are glia, glial cells. And one in particular, one glial cell is this oligodendrocyte. Right? And before that, I sort of skipped that uh, an, an unmyelinated cell, like an unmyelinated neuron, right? signals that travel to an unmyelinated neuron will be unreliable and sluggish, okay? which leads to unreliable sluggish movement and thought processes, right? So a highly myelinated neuron, a circuit of neurons, okay, will, do, will lead to right, faster, more synchronized thought processes and movement, all right? Now, this is what it actually looks like under the microscope, all right? Now, uh, these oligodendrocytes myelinate the neurons at a running out of time, when you are in, involved in deep practice, okay, deep practice, that means that you are struggling, but you're making mistakes, and you're uh, persisting through your frustrations, okay, that's when the, these neural circuits light up and the oligodendrocytes <coughs> wrap myelin around those neurons. But so, uh, in summary, all right, all thought processes, all movement, all feelings start off as uh, impulses or signals travelling through nerve uh, fibres, a circuit of nerve fibres. Uh, myelin wraps around the fibres, increasing the speed and accuracy and strength of uh, those messages. Uh, when you deep practice, okay, over and over again, the more you deep practice, the more myelin wraps around the neurons, right? the faster, the stronger uh, your thought processes and your movements become. Right? So in, in a way, learning equals uh, uh, myelin wrapping around. Thank you. That was awesome. <laughs>
the internet sort of on streaming to each other. Um, that was fine, but the main problem was our fantastic uh, DUT network that <laughs> wouldn't, wouldn't let us um, yeah. send stuff out or whatever. That's um, like a big um, roadblock, basically. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's on the wrong side. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we suddenly came up with, I don't know where we came up with the answer, but we pulled out of the air, hang on, the Adobe Suite is on all department computers. It's free, it's there. There's a thing called Adobe Connect, and that's what um, is, like is we're recording right with, a, we've got a little webcam on that, it's going straight into the computer, it's going to Adobe Connect. The settings are really easy to learn, what we took us yeah. about, took us about, uh, only three yeah, square words? About, yeah, about a, a, <laughs> a five minutes. Yeah, about five minutes, five minutes, minutes, minutes three square words yeah. and we were there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, nice ones, weren't they, Tyler? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we've got a set. Um, so really, it's very simple. But the good thing was, I suddenly started thinking, hey, what, what, what can we do with this? Isn't this great? Like, Teachers in year 12, you sometimes have workshops in the holidays. So why get out of bed? <laughs> <laughs> I can do this for home. I can do it. I can do it, I can do it on my iPad from, from home. The kids don't have to come into school for a little workshop in the holidays, right? For the year 12, we can do this. We can stream. We can even, at the moment, we're just streaming out one way, but we could have it as a conference. So that, um, so that multiple cameras. Mul so the kids with their laptops or their iPads would use their cameras, and we could switch between people, right? Um, we can control, and so we can have a like a, a video meeting. What are we going to call that? <laughs> What's uh, the right word for that? <laughs> yeah, video conference. Video conference. <laughs> see, I told you, sort of my right hand man. Yeah, all the time, even with the words. So um, we can look. I think the message that we're trying to say is that, like, Ty's a bit of a genius with video editing, but to try, we tried something new and it wasn't too hard. We didn't have to go out and buy any other stuff. We haven't got any high-tech thousand-dollar equipment. If I'd have been doing this, if I'd have been doing this seven years ago, which I was doing in a, uh, a TV studio, I'd have had thousands and thousands of dollars worth of equipment. We're doing the same thing today with, it costs us nothing. We bought, oh, well, hang on, you bought, went and bought a splitter, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. yeah what, so, what, what, five bucks? Uh, it was actually two dollars. So. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, really cheap. So we got it, the, the message is that there's some fantastic technology out there, have a go at it, and there's a lot of help around. There's people, you know, we got online and talked to a few people and you, tweeted and whatever yeah. and Simon got some help and all that sort of thing and together we worked it out and we've got it going and we're pretty happy with it yeah. the way it's going now so um, yeah, awesome. thank, hey, thank Tom yeah. <laughs> and everyone just quickly I was going to say something as well uh, for you people watching uh, around the world I think there's about five people now um, <laughs> quick, go, go on to your Twitter and don't forget to hashtag TM5 squared and uh, watch watch the live feed next we have um, Liz the Maltes our um, head teacher of um, English at the school and uh, literacy expert. Okay, awesome. All right. We ready? Okay. Who's timing? Benny? Ben, I'm going to talk about awesome writing because we've been doing really awesome writing here at this school now for three years in English and we're really, really excited about it. Why did we do it? We had lots of kids, um, you know, bored, lazy. Why do I have to write this? I don't want to write anything. I hate these books, miss. You know, all the usual things that anyone who teaches English knows about. So, you know, and as I said, don't get me started on NAPLAN. <laughs> NAPLAN's telling me, hey, you're really good with those, you know, not so good kids. But your top kids, they're not going anywhere. So what do we do? Well, we have readers. We've had lots of time talking with readers. I had a little lunchtime club. We love to read, Miss. We read lots of fantasy. We're really good at that. We like to talk about it. And, of course, some of them were writing heaps, heaps and heaps and heaps at, uh, at home all the time. 
So, wow, I have kids who are passionate about writing. Enter the research assignment. Very scary, no topic, Ooh. no limits, mm. no marks. No marks? What kid's going to do it without no marks? It's always, does this count, miss? No, this doesn't count. Really? Why would I do it? Because you're going to love it. That's why you're going to do it. And truly, no marks. What they get is a beautiful piece of paper and it says high distinction. Sorry, I didn't bring any examples. High distinction, distinction or credit. So if you finish, you are a winner. So the starting point. Because, you know, they're like, oh, what am I going to write? I don't know, I'm not interested in anything. Um, so I didn't, you know, before we got started, I said, just write 10 things down. 10 things that you're interested in. I'm not interested in anything. Passionate about I'm not passionate about anything. And they, and actually, they weren't that bad. They were, okay, yeah, we can write these down. And there were lots of things I wrote down. And quite interesting things. You know, really odd things and things that, for me, I don't know anything about that. I really like soccer. Great, I'm an English teacher, I know so much about soccer. Um, or, you know, I really like uh, the history of uh, Julius Caesar and the Egyptian campaigns. I actually taught history and I still know nothing about the Egyptian campaigns, but, you know, that happened. So they, they did their ten, uh, whatever they were, and then they had to choose one. They had to choose it and say, which one am I going to write about and what am I going to share? And of course, now it gets down to the nitty gritty. Now it gets down to what am I doing and what are my teachers doing? Because we don't just want to recount, hey, Julius Caesar went over to Egypt, you know, slept with Cleopatra, took a whole lot of land, left a baby and left. No, this is not enough. Um, so to make it interesting, to make it fun, a particular child who was interested in Julius Caesar, this is this one from year eight, kids in year 10 now. It is. It's a choose your own adventure book. Okay, so do you want to make the legend become true? Turn to page seven. He had to have this all stuck up all over his room at home to make sense of it. If you're confident, Caesar, then you go to page 18. But if you're not, then you'll go to page 13. And whatever happened, of course, the ending was the same. He got stabbed in the Senate. <laughs> okay, so, and the soccer? I don't know if you know this, Probably you do because it's on at the moment. Did you know that every World Cup soccer has its own ball? Yes. Oh, smarty pants. I had no <laughs> idea. I had no idea. One of my kids did a whole thing, the history of World Cup soccer balls. You know, that's fun to keep you awake. But actually it was, you know, and I, it was extraordinary. And so, you know, the, the ideas began to gel. And what was really important here was sitting down with them one on one. So we're in this space. Um, and it was actually still not quite a beautiful space then as it is now. Um, and they say, oh, well, maybe I'll do this. And the really important thing is talking to them about how to put it out. There. One minute. Oh, you're kidding. Okay, once a lesson, once a fortnight around here, they write their proposal and they do it. We've got all sorts of things. I've got to tell you, we did it again last year and, we're, and we just started today with Year 9. They're doing it with time, and the ones that did it two years ago are now doing red. I just have to tell you, though, they were enthusiastic. That's what teacher said, you can read it while I talk. One of my favourite ones um, from two years ago, uh, she uh, loved Beyonce. She sang a Beyonce song and then told us why she was so inspired by Beyonce. Um, we also, I have to show you this. Leonardo da Vinci cut his ear off. That's right. I'm going to research it. I wrote the diary for the year. All the passion and stuff that he went through by hand. Um, last year, year nine, 10,000 word stories. One of them came second in New South Wales in national competition. I am so excited and they're doing that again. So they do anything from one and a half, 2,000 word stories through to 10,000 novellas. Time. And have a fantastic time. And if you want to look at their work, it's all here. It's from uh, uh, eight and nine. And if you want to talk to me about it, sure. <laughs> Thank you. Introduce uh, Jonathan Pugh, an educational leader from the Northern Beaches Christian School, uh, to talk about the first steps of solo taxonomy. Thank you. Thank you. What is this? Yep. So if you want to get yourself set up. Oh, okay. Okay, you're on.
why he's doing that. I'm John O'Q. I um, teach up at Lawn Beaches. I was taught at St Luke's as well. Um, and Oxford Falls Grammar on the beaches and another school out west. Um, currently, my role at Northern Beaches is a science teacher, but I'm also head of the Year 8 First Program, which teaches in a big open space like this, integrating both science and geography together. Um, what was I saying? <laughs> no, yeah. Just. As I said, we're flying by the seat of the Yeah, it's maybe if you stand there, just roll down, get the three pictures to come up. Yeah, here you go, I'll leave you. If you want to. I'll stand here. Right. Yeah. Let's touch screen. You can touch screen that if you don't want to use the mouse. Wow. Is it easier? Hey. Cool. All right. So, um, Quest up at Northern Beaches, integrated program. It's open plan teaching for pretty much half the time. The other time we're in traditional science labs. The, um, so, we have um, bring your own device. So, kids have a whole cluster of devices that they bring. All the learning is online, so our learning is blended. Um, and we really are trying to have project-based learning at, at the core of what we do. Um, at, um, the team I have, there's six teachers on Quest, including myself. Half of us have been doing it probably for about three or four years now. The other half are all brand new to it this year. The biggest problem we've come across is um, these two questions, how do you design tasks that are, um, kids can engage with by just jumping on a laptop and accessing it straight off the internet? Um, and what are the, what's the actual role of the teacher in the classroom? Um, and the problem is a bigger problem across the whole school because the this, this whole school is going problem-based learning and open plan learning. Um, this is a diagram our principal, Stephen Harris, produced. Um, and it kind of says, you know, if you are too friendly, or you're too remote, that's a bit dangerous. You know, you, there's the right kind of relationship you have with the student. And then standing up the front the whole time talking is dangerous. The thing I love about this teacher meet is that it's not going to be people standing up at the front the whole time we get to question ourselves. Okay? Um, but a, a problem we've had at, at Oxford, well, sorry, Northern Beaches is that um, we've come from a traditional place where a teacher has control of the classroom. We've kind of been told, or the teachers have been told, that's not where we want you gone too far to the other side where we've become too remote and yeah, the kids don't feel there's a teacher there to help them. Um, and so, I'm going to run out of time. But, um, so somewhere in the middle there, if we're great teachers and we're relational, we get the relationship right, um, if we're actively engaging with those kids and getting the feedback from the kids, then we'll know kind of where we need to be with each individual kid. Um, so here's a quote from Hattie, and it's all about, if we're doing that thing, we're helping the kids to do the where to next. What is the next kid for every individual student? Um, to get into the question then of how do we design our learning tasks, um, when I was doing my masters, I set out with this great question, what is 21st century learning? And after reading a whole heap, I said, that's a rubbish question, and came back to the fact that what is great learning? What is great teaching? Um, and so you can see there, it's being an active teacher and getting feedback from kids. It's um, personalising the learning of every student because you know them really well. It's finding ways to collaborate. And um, the one I'll be focusing on more today is the deep thinking aspect, which links into the brain very nicely. Um, this has come out recently from Atsul, okay? Has some similar concepts about co-creating, getting ideas integrated, um, getting connections to the outside world, which is what problem-based learning is very good at, um, and personalising the learning. One of the answers I've come across is the solo taxonomy, okay? Because we were there going, how do we judge where these kids are at? How do we know what the next step is? Um, I am a devotee of blooms, and I struggle with blooms. I remember being at another school, being head of the science department, and setting up some, some questions for the students to do, and having teachers coming to me and going, I can't do this, how do you expect me to get kids to do this, okay? And it was a problem of not understanding how to do that deep order thinking. And I think solo um, is, is the answer to that problem. <laughs> okay, um, so there's deep learning, there's three kind of bits to deep learning, um, surface deep and um, extended. And then John Hattie says that's the best way to go. Um, <laughs> let me quickly explain to you what solo is. Um, pretty structural is you have no clue, okay? You want to do something, but you don't know where to start. 
unistructural means you've kind of got one idea. Okay, multi-structural, you come to three ideas. Uh, when you get to relational, you've actually linked your concepts together. Okay, you start to get to some deep thinking. And then the, the best thing, if you get kids doing it, you're extending those linked ideas into another context. Okay, and you can see there, there's a guy who builds a spaceship. Um, so how are we, we doing that? How have we implemented it so far at Northern Beaches? We are, I learnt about Solo via a teach meet a year ago. Alice Long was talking about it. I couldn't get to the teach meet, I was following the Twitter feed. Oh. We've introduced it to the teachers, like I have very briefly here. Um, we've implemented it, so this is a, a page from our learning page where the kids go. This is one task. You can see we've set our tasks against them. That was really hard for the teachers to start with, and after about six months, they're getting there. Okay. Um, we've put it into a recent verbal assessment task where we just asked kids what they knew, and we sat there and we just see, were they just giving us definitions? Were they connecting ideas? Were they extending those ideas into other concepts? And I'll finish with, <laughs> these are the people that have helped me out, so please follow them, they will help you. All right, thank you. What's this? Okay, this, this is the real difference, I think, is that feedback. Now, I'm going to, I think on the Padlet there are a few things, I have to refresh the page, but this is where I hit the 10 minute button and we're running a little late, that's okay. We actually talk to the presenters. So if you want to talk to Michelle, I can go and sit over there and pretend, but uh, are there any questions you'd like to ask of any of those presentations to the presenters? Um, for the solo, when you were talking about the different stages uh, of unstructured all the way through to extended abstract, um, is there is it a linear flow or is it jumped around depending on concepts? Etc. Um, so when you talk about blooms, people fall into the trap of thinking it's linear. Mm. Um, and yes, solo is more linear because you have ideas, you connect the ideas, and then you extend them. So it has the advantage over blooms in that you can see the progression of thinking. Um, the other trap that you can fall into, because we're in a K to six school now teaching, I can see, I go into kindergarten classes um, and stage one classes and I do little science demos with them and they ask me questions and their questions are telling me that they're thinking, that, that it's, they've, they've picked up the concept we're talking about and they're extending it into another. Uh, they're at a much simpler level than would be in year 10 or 12, but they're still capable of thinking at that extended <laughs> level. So. Hey Steve. <laughs> Okay, any more questions? I've just got a comment. Yeah. Right? yeah. Uh, Elizabeth, I was very struck by what you were saying about your awesome writing there and the fact that it was a voluntary participation and there was a reward and how close that was to people that playing games. Yes. Where you give them, a, they've come into a volunteer and if they get a reward in terms of their marketing, I thought that was great. Well, they didn't actually know what they were going to get at the end. I just told yeah. them what yeah. you get at the end is an awesome piece of writing and I think you're awesome. Um, I didn't quite use that language. I came up with the certificates afterwards when I realised mm -hmm. I really had to acknowledge these. Because even the, in the first year, um, um, some of them were extraordinary. I've got one here that, can I just, because I can answer questions here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 this is a really amazing story about why they got so passionate about it. One of my students' babysitters had killed herself the year before and she suffered from um, eating disorders. So she said, Miss, I want to write a story about eating disorders. Now, sometimes that can be a really sort of, you know, just, oh, and, and where they come from and what they are. What she actually did, she based it on, on her, her um, nanny, but changed it a lot, because she was only nine, 18 or 19. And that, and that story was 5,000 words long, and it was extraordinary. If I read you the first part of it, it start, the very first part of it just starts with a not, oh dear, my nanny had a, an eating disorder. It started with a breakfast scene where the mother says, come on darling, just eat that. And every time she looked away, she was feeding it to the cat. And they were adhering to that whole thing of show, don't tell. It was, you know, I cried reading it. And uh, she's one of the ones, of course, that writes novellas now. But yeah, it was very fun. Thank you. All right, any other questions? Any comments that you'd like to... Uh, well, we're very shy. That's okay. <laughs> All right, well, we are actually a few minutes um, running a little bit late. So what we're going to do now is we're actually going to run um, into session two.